So you're making a multiplayer game and you actually want to have people join your game in an easy way. Well, previously, you would need a good amount of technical knowledge to host a dedicated server online and then match people together depending on certain parameters like let's say their skill level. But now it's never been easier thanks to Unity's Gaming Services or UGS. Unity offers a host of several services that can be extremely helpful when creating a multiplayer game, two of which we'll be covering in this video, hosting and matchmaking. They also have others such as analytics, monetization, lobby, voice chat, and more. And thank you to Unity for sponsoring this video. If you haven't watched the previous video, I highly recommend you do so. However, it is not necessary for this video. In the previous video, I went over netcode for game objects and showed you how to make your own multiplayer game from scratch within the course. And so in this video, we'll be building upon that snake game and adding some code to enable hosting and matchmaking. Once again, you do not need that previous video, however, but I highly recommend you watch it. The link will be in the description. And so here you'll see that I have two editor instances open and I'm just going to show you that it works before we get started. And so when we press start and wait a few seconds, you'll see that our match will start and we are currently the only player in this map. You'll see that in the console, we have our player ID. So each player has an ID associated with it. This is the ticket number. So essentially when a player wants to request to join a match, a ticket is created and that ticket tries to get filled. Once that ticket is filled, they are able to join the match. And you'll see that here we have ticket assigned. And you'll see that we print here the IP and the port. So essentially what we're going to try to do is that once we host our game on the server and a player tries to join the match, they create a ticket. And when the ticket is assigned, so whenever Unity finds the correct server given the requirements or creates a new one, then essentially we're going to pass in the IP and the port to our Unity transport, which we can get through the network manager singleton and getting that component that's also attached to it, the Unity transport. So we can manually set the IP and port that we want to connect to, and then we can just start the client. And so you'll see that if I go into the other parallel sync clone here and we click play as well, you'll see that we also sign in anonymously, then we can start and it will create that player ID for us. And now it will create another player and it will actually join the existing match. And you'll see that the movement is actually pretty responsive and I don't have any client side prediction of the sort. Right now it's using server authoritative movement. All right, so this is quite an in-depth tutorial. So I do want to go over some terms just before we dive right in. And so I'm gonna start with what we had previously. So this is what we had. And this is essentially Unity on the cloud. <laughs> All right, so to host our game, we are going to be using Multiplay, which is Unity's scalable server hosting platform. And Apex Legend actually uses this, so you know that it's battle tested and it works very well. So essentially with Multiplay, it will scale the servers depending on demand and of course the parameters you give it. So the more people that are playing your game, the more servers are going to spin up automatically to adjust for demand. And so Unity has a very generous free tier. So if you go to gaming services pricing and we could scroll all the way down until it says game server hosting multiplay, you'll see that they give you $800 in credit valid for six months from your sign up date. And then after you use these credits, these are the costs depending on your CPU usage, your storage usage, etc. But this is a very fair pricing and you are getting a lot of features in return. So essentially how it works is that we're going to take our game and when we build our game, we are going to build it as a dedicated server build. In this case, we're going to build it for a Linux dedicated server build, which is the default on what Unity accepts for multiplay. And so I'll show you how to do that. So we'll package up our game and essentially upload these files into Unity's multiplay Unity Gaming Services solution, we set some parameters and the rest is magic. There are some definitions I want to cover beforehand. Oh, this is the wrong slide, sorry. All right, so there exists a concept called fleet. So a fleet is essentially a collection of servers within a specific region. So a region would be North America, Europe, Canada. And so you can have various fleets and each fleet would cover a specific region. So you can have a fleet in North America, in Europe and etc. And so we'll be setting this up in our parameters. 
Then we have a query protocol, which helps get information from the server. And so luckily you do not need to know what these are in depth. We'll just be using the default, which is SQP or server query protocol. Essentially what this does is it helps retrieve information from the server using UDP or IP packets. It helps get information from the server, such as the number of players, the IP address, the port, analytics, and it can also detect server crashes. So with this, we'll be able to tell how many players are exactly using our services, and we'll also be able to tell if everything's on fire and nothing's working and no one can connect to the server. And so once we upload our build to our server, how are players actually going to connect to the server and find matches? Well, Unity has something called Matchmaker, and we'll be using this solution to help match players with other players and start servers automatically. And so there are a lot of terms associated with Matchmaker as well, which I will cover. However, first, let's go over actually uploading our build to Unity Gaming Services and connecting our editor. And then we can go about that process of matching the players. All right, so we have our game here. First thing we need to do is actually create a project in Unity Gaming Services that is associated with our Unity project. So for that, we can go to Edit, Project Settings, then click Services on the left-hand side. And so here you'll have to select an organization. So just click that and select your organization. In my case, I'm just going to select my Samyam YouTube organization. And so if you don't have an organization, you can just go into your Unity account settings, click organizations and create a new organization, give it a name and select the appropriate industry. And then you'd want to actually refresh this page, maybe even restart Unity to have it show up on this tab. All right. And so once we select an organization, we can click create project ID. And so this will create a project within Unity Gaming Services with the name that we've selected for our Unity project, and it will give us a project ID. And so this is extremely important. If you don't have this set up, we'll not be able to continue. And right here, be sure to check if your app will be targeted to children under the age of 13. In my case, I will click no, and then I will click save. All right, so let's see this project in the Unity Gaming Services platform. So we can go to unity.com slash solutions slash gaming services, and all these links will be in the description and you can click get started for free. And so you'll see that I already have my dashboard set up. If you click switch project, you'll see a list of all of the projects you've created with UGS. I will just click slither.io and I've also already set it up on my part, but you should not be able to continue unless you enter your credit card information, which there should be a big button somewhere saying, please input your credit card information. And this is so Unity can charge you properly if you go past of your credit limit. Now, Unity is aware that this creates some friction for potential signups to the site. So it is definitely a concern of theirs and they are considering removing the need for credit card to get started. Hopefully that happens soon. All right. And so once you're in your dashboard for Unity Gaming Services, if you look on the left, you'll see that there is a multiplayer tab all the way down at the bottom. So let's just click multiplayer. And so this is where we'll be basically all of our time within this multiplayer tab. And so first, what we want to set up is the game server hosting. You'll see that there are some other features like voice and chat, matchmaker, lobby, relay and friends, which seems like friends recently came out and that's really cool. You can add friends. But anywho, let's go back to the game server hosting and you'll see that mine says payment information added. If it does not say that, you'll have to add your payment information and let's click set up multiplay. And so you'll see that right here, it'll say enabling game server hosting for your project. And this is because we already linked our project to the Unity Gaming Services through our services tab in the editor. So just sit tight and wait for this to finish. Alrighty, and now once that's done, we can go on and ahead and click integrate game server. And so we'll be clicking Unity in this case, but this is actually engine agnostic, which is really cool. So you can use Unity Gaming Services within Unreal or a custom engine, which is kind of ironic and funny. <laughs> so if you click next, you'll see we need to link our Unity project, which we did that already. And then we need to actually install the package into our project. So depending on what version of Unity you're using, in my case, I'm using version 2021 or above, we can go into the package manager and then add package by name, com.unity.services.multiplay, which you can just copy this to the 
clipboard and then we can go back into our editor go to window package manager then up here click this plus button on the top left then add package by name and then you can just click Control v or right click and paste then we can just add the multiplay into our project all right and so once that's downloaded you'll see it is a pre-release package however it works just great we can click the close button and now we can go back into our setup guide and click finish next thing we're going to need to do is actually create a build so to create a build we're actually going to have to build our project and you'll see that we'll need to build it in the linux operating system and we'll be uploading it directly by dragging and dropping the files in however it does support docker containers so i'll be covering the direct file upload which is the easiest and the most intuitive so let's prepare our build so first of all we're gonna have to download a package if you don't have it already so when you go into file and build settings we're actually going to want to switch to this dedicated server platform and we're going to want to select the target platform as linux and you'll see that we don't have it installed here all right and so to download that dedicated build support we'll need to go into our unity hub then go into the installs tab on the left then choose the version of unity that you're using and click add modules and so unselect the visual studio community because we do not need that and so we're going to want to download the linux dedicated server build support and with this we'll be able to build our server so just click install there and just wait for that to complete then you might want to restart your unity editor for the changes to take effect and so once that's done and unity opens back up we can go back into our build settings and now under the dedicated server we can select linux and then be sure to click switch platform on the bottom right to switch to our dedicated server and also be sure to add your scene to the build and so before we actually press build we're actually going to want to change some settings here so first how exactly is unity going to run our game well this essentially will output an exe file which unity will then run with command line arguments and if you're not familiar with command line arguments essentially when you open up a command prompt and let's say you want to start your game exe you can actually pass to it certain parameters such as if you want to be able to cheat in the game maybe you'll pass in a cheat command line argument and so unity has a couple of them that we can pass into our build which will be configured automatically or we can actually set our own custom ones and so we'll actually be using two of these here we'll be using no graphics for our server one and also batch mode which I will go over this a little bit more in a bit. And so essentially we're going to pass in a parameter that says server so that our Unity editor knows that this instance is a server. And with that, we can perform any pre-processing or actually start the server. So let's go into our scripts folder and let's create a new script. Right click and create a new script called server startup or anything you want to name it. And so when you double click that, then we'll have our IDE open here. And so we can remove this update function and most of these. We're going to keep using Unity Engine. And so essentially on start, we want to check what our command line arguments are. So we can do that by saying var args equals system.environment.getCommandLineArgs. And that auto completion was thanks to GitHub Copilot, if you're wondering how that worked. So we can get the command line arguments with this line and variable just sets it to an string array right here, which you can also write out the type. Then let's loop over our command line arguments and you'll see that it's doing it for me, but I'll just write it out manually. So for int i equals zero, i is less than args length. Oh, wow, this is annoying. I'm just going to hide it for now. All right, and then we want to loop over all of the arguments. So args.length, so this keeps going for each argument and then Let's just do i++ plus plus or plus plus i, which will increment our index. So we're gonna add more to this later, but for now, we just wanna check if this is a server. So if our current argument equals equals, and then we're gonna call it dedicated server. So this is our argument. Then we know that this is a server. So up here, let's create a Boolean. Let's call it server and equal it to false. And if it is a dedicated server, then let's set our server to true. And with this Boolean, we'll be able to start the server. Or if it's not a server, we'll start the client. So after this for loop, we can do if it's a server, 
then we can call start server, which will create that right now. So let's make a private void start server. And to start our server, we can just call start server network manager dot singleton dot start server. However, we need to pass in the IP and the port before we actually pass in the server. So how do we do that? And how do we even know the IP and the port? Well, for the IP, it is just going to be our local IP. So in our case, we can just do it 0, .0, .0, .0. So if we scroll all the way up, we can just make a private string and we can call this internal server IP. And we can equal this to our IP, which will be 0, .0, .0, .0. And we'll also want a variable for our port. So we can do private int, let's call this server port. And let's set a default value of 7777, which if you go into our network manager under the Unity Transport, you'll see that that's the default value under the port. So if we scroll back down into our start server function, then we can actually get our Unity Transport component by doing network manager dot singleton dot get component of type Unity Transport. So we can do this because the Unity Transport is on the same game object as the network manager. And you'll see that there's something off here. It's missing the Unity netcode library. So I can just click on it and press control dot and it'll add that for me up here. So if we scroll up, you'll see that it adds both the Unity netcode and the Unity netcode dot transports dot UTP namespace. So now we can use it in our project. So if we scroll back down. Now we can set the connection data. So set connection data. We can set it to our internal server IP and our port. So server port, and you'll see that there is a small issue here. This one takes a U short, not an integer. So we can convert this into a U short as so by casting it, or we can just go back up here and instead of an integer, we can just declare this as a U short. And we won't actually be changing this internal server IP. So we can just mark this as a constant. And if you want to be really neat about it, you can actually change the name to internal server IP, which writer is complaining to me about. And so the actual important part is the port here. How do we know what port to put? Well, luckily when Unity, when Unity Gaming Services will start our game, it will actually dynamically pass in some parameters through the command line arguments that we can fetch and use. So you see that if we go into the documentation, there are some launch parameters here and we scroll down, you'll see that it'll automatically include a port for us, a query port, which this is for the SQP and a log directory so we can see our logs. And you can add in even more. Here are some of the ones that they support. So in our case, we'll be passing in our port. So let's also fetch our port. So after this if statement, let's do another if statement. If args at i equals port and so the way it's going to be formatted is we have our port and then after that is another command line argument with the port number. So if our port, so we can check if that parameter actually exists just to be on the safe side. So if i plus one, so if the next index is less than the arguments dot length, just making sure we don't get any out of bound errors, then we can set our port. So we can set our server port equal to our args at i plus one. And then this is a u short. So we're going to want to do int dot parse to convert it to an integer. And then we can then cast it into a u short. And I added an extra parentheses here by accident. So now we have the server port and that will be passed into our server port here. There's actually one other thing that we're going to need to fetch, but it isn't needed for this section at the moment. All right. So that is it for this section. One other thing that we're going to want to do, and this is per unity recommendation. So you'll see that if we go into multiplay, the best practices is that set a target frame rate in unity to avoid causing your server to use hundred percent of the CPU. It's recommended and also recommended to set the vsync count to zero. So we're just going to copy this, press copy. It's going to be in the description and it's called target FPS. So then let's create a new script here and call it target FPS. Double click that. And I'm just going to copy in that script. And I'm just going to remove these two using statements that are not being used. You can also make this a serialized field and make it private. All right. So once that's done, then let's minimize that and go back to the unity editor. 
And let's right click on the hierarchy and create an empty new game object. We can call this server manager. And so in the server manager, we can add the component in the inspector with our server startup script. We can also add in our target FPS script. All right, and now that basic setup is done. Now we can go into the file and build settings and actually build our project. There's something else I want to mention, which might be neat. Under the player settings, you can actually add scripting define symbols. So for example, let's say you know that this build is going to be for the server. So we can call this server and you can click apply. Then in your code, for example, if you only want this function to execute on the server, you can do hashtag if server, and then you have to make sure to end that hashtag. So end if. So essentially this code will only execute if this is a server and you can use this anywhere within your code or if you want this to execute if it's not the server then you just put an exclamation point in front of it and you'll see that right now it's not going to be executed because we set server as a scripting defined symbol and this is true so if we remove that now it will be executed but for now i'm just going to remove that i think that's a neat little trick all right, and now we can go back into the build settings and build our project to make sure you have the scene added. So let's just click build. Let's right click and create a new folder and call this builds. I'm also going to right click within that folder and add another folder called Linux server, Linux server. And then I'm just going to click that folder and we can give it a file name. I'm just going to call this SSS snake and click save. And now we just wait for it to build. All right, and once that's done building, it'll open up the folder with the build. And so this is our executable, the x86 underscore 64. I have a million tabs open. Okay, so once you've created your build, once again, go into your game server hosting setup guide and create a new build, or you can just go to builds here to create a build. And let's call our build something. In this case, you can call it dev prod, the name of your game. Usually you might want to have different builds for different occasions. So let's say you have one build for testing and one build for production. So let's just call this the dev build and select Linux and direct file upload. Click next. Then we can just go into our build folder, select all of the files and drag it into this little field here and then click upload files. And this is super easy, super simple. It does all of the heavy lifting for you, which I really like. And so later when we actually add matchmaker, we're going to replace the files in our build. And I'm going to show you how to do that because that's important. So if you have some changes you want to make, you can easily alter that data. So once that's done uploading, click next and then click finish. So once we have our build, you'll see the build details here and we can go into files and you'll see that the status is still syncing. So it's still processing this data and we won't be able to really configure anything further until this is done syncing and says that it's ready. So just hold on tight until the status says ready. And if you see that it's not saying ready for quite some time, just try refreshing and you'll see that your status might be finished. All right, and once that status is finally ready, we can continue. So we can go now into our build configurations. For every build, we need a configuration. Basically, we're gonna tell Unity Gaming Services how to run the build. So let's go ahead and create a build configuration. So when we assign a build configuration, there may be several build configurations per build. So you should give it an accurate name, depending on if this is dev or prod, prod meaning production, which is a released build, or depending on the region it's in. In this case, I'm just gonna call this dev A, because I might want a dev B. And so for build here, just select the build that's already available for the game server executable. We're going to type in 86 and select our snake x8664 file, the query type, which you can see more information on the documentation. In this case, we're going with the default SQP, as I previously mentioned, and this helps us get analytics crashes from our game and query the server. And we have the launch parameters, which is extremely important. So with the launch parameters, this is what's going to be passed into our server. So we want to add one. So at the end, let's add in our dedicated server parameter so that we can start our server. So we have a port, a query port. The query port is for the SQP query type. The log file is where the logs for our server are going to be stored. And you can just keep this as is and dedicated server. 
and let's actually add two more let's add one called batch mode and another one called no graphics so what do these mean so if we go into the unity documentation you'll see that these are already predefined so for batch mode it will run the command line arguments automatically without any needed human interaction it also suppresses any pop-up windows that may require human interaction and with no graphics when we run this in batch mode, this essentially will initialize our game with absolutely no graphics. And for our server, we don't need any graphics because the server is just running on the cloud. It's just doing the calculations. We don't really need to see any graphics because no one's going to be able to see it anyways. So luckily with this flag, we can disable graphics from being shown in our game. And so once you have that filled out, then we can click next. We don't need to change anything here. You can add in extra configuration variables when a server becomes allocated. So essentially when a server starts up, you may want to add extra variables. In this case, we don't need it, but you'll see that if you add a variable, you can add a key and value pair here, which you can then use this information in Unity to maybe configure some properties. You'll see that the game server hosting generates a server.json file for each server. It has a set of built-in variables, but you can create custom configuration variables to track data that's important to you. This can be a difficulty modifier, a game mode, or a game map. And you can define these per build. And so when a server is assigned or created or allocated, you can fetch these variables and do something within your code. All right, so let's click next. And then we can set our usage settings. So in this case, we're just going to go with the default, which we have CPU speed and memory and you can hover over these to see what each of them does. You can also set custom parameters. This will be highly dependent on your needs and your game. So obviously before publishing your multiplayer game, you're gonna wanna do extensive testing to see how much CPU, RAM, memory you're using and adjust the values accordingly. As you can see in the documentation, if you notice that servers running a build configuration lag or have performance issues, you might wanna increase the CPU or the RAM. Or if your server performance is okay, we can increase the amount of servers available. So if we go back, let's just select the default one and click finish here. And you'll see that now we have our build configuration along with our usage settings. So we have a build, we have a configuration. Now we need to create a fleet. So let's create a fleet and I'm just gonna call this the dev a fleet. Again, you might wanna have several of these depending on your builds. So we are gonna select our build configuration, which is the one we just made. You can also select multiple here, but we only have one. Let's click next. Then we're gonna to wanna to select the region that we want our fleet to run at. So again, you can have multiple fleets in different regions. So in my case, I'm in North America. So I'm just gonna select that and I want the server to be located in that location. Then for minimum available servers, I'm gonna put zero because if you put one, that means that one server will always be running and that will incur cost. However, if you put zero, this is better for testing so that the server becomes deallocated and you're not using up resources and paying money when you don't need to be. However, when you actually have your multiplayer game published, you're going to want to set this minimum to one because you're always going to want to have a server active just in case. So in this case, I'm just going to put zero. And for the maximum amount of servers, this can vary depending on what you need. And essentially it's how many servers you want to scale up to. In this case, I'm just gonna put three. You can put one and then just change it later as needed. So click finish. And now we have our builds, our build configuration and our fleet done. So now when that's done, we can actually test to see if this is getting allocated correctly. Essentially if our server is being created and for that we can go into the test allocations here we can create a test allocation. We can select our fleet, our region, and our build configuration, essentially the ones that we previously created. Then we can click next and run test. So this will run the server for us. And then we can check the logs to see if there are any errors and fix those before we continue. And this will take a while, so just hold on tight. All right, and once our server has been allocated, we can click finish and you'll see under test allocations, we can now see that we have an allocated server with the time remaining, so this is active for about one hour, which is just fine for testing purposes. You can see the server and the port, and you can also deallocate it through this dashboard. If you click on the server ID, you'll see that we get teleported to the servers tab and you can see our analytics for our server. And so right now we don't have any users, obviously, because we just started the server, but you can see 
the number of concurrent users, the memory usage, the CPU usage, how many crashes, and how many major events there are, along with the location. You can also click on the events tab and you can see different events that has happened with our server, along with the timestamp. And finally, in the logs, we can click the logs here and you can see exactly what's getting run and if there are any errors. So you see that everything's just fine. There are some errors regarding uh, shader sprites and whatnot, but this doesn't really impact us, especially because our server is not running any graphics. So obviously these sprites are not going to be supported on the GPU. However, there's something here called no connection approval callback defined. Connection approval will time out. So that one does seem a little important. And if we exit out of that, we can also stop the server and restart the server just in case any changes need to be made. So let's just take a look at that server callback function real quick. So that honestly might be because our server startup runs in the start function and the connection approval handler also runs in the start function. So the server might be starting before this connection approval callback is being set. And so let's just set this to awake so that this is set right at the beginning before the server startup start function is called. Alrighty, and so we can go back into our test allocations and you'll see that it's actually deallocated because no one's actually using the server. So if the server isn't being used, it just deallocates it automatically. So we can just clear this here. And essentially, that's it. We've hosted our build online. And so this is great and all, but how do we actually connect to it and get our players to play with each other? And this is where Matchmaker comes in. So click that matchmaker icon here and this will actually help us match our players and do all that heavy lifting and all that logic for us and we can just sit back and let unity do the hard work so if you click on set up matchmaker there's a ton of stuff that comes up first let's click integrate matchmaker so click unity and then sdk you can also use the api and call that directly We've already linked the Unity project, so we can just click next. And we're gonna wanna add the matchmaker package. So just click copy to clipboard like the previous one. And we can go back into our Unity editor, click window package manager. Then let's add a package by name, control V or paste com.unity.services.matchmaker and let's add that in and wait for that to be installed. And once we have matchmaker installed, which currently at the release of this video is 1.0.0 version, we can actually go back to our Unity dashboard and click finish. And so now there is a couple stuff here. There's a queue, there's a pool, there's tickets. It's kind of confusing. And so let's go back into my visualization here that will help you better understand these concepts. So we have our matchmaker, which is going to connect one computer or one client to another client and start up servers automatically. So we have our players here. How exactly does one player connect to our server? Or if there is no server, how does that player start a server or a match so that other players can join? First, one of the most important concepts to understand is a ticket. A ticket is essentially an intent to find a match. For example, if you go to an amusement park, you may need a ticket to enter and play the games or go on the rides. So each connecting client We'll have a ticket which then gets put into a queue which a queue is essentially a waiting line for people who want to find a match so let's say you're trying to enter the amusement park and there's quite some people in there already you have your ticket but there is a queue to enter and you may be directed to different parts of the park depending on your ticket so you can have several queues for example you can have a queue for a free-for-all game mode a battle royale game mode and a team deathmatch game mode so you can have several queues. Then within a queue, you have a pool. And so I know this is a lot of concepts, but just try to think of it on a macro level, high level overview. Think of the queue as the type of the match you want to join. And you can implement it in a different way, but this is the easiest way to understand it, at least to me. And then within the pool, obviously you may have several matches going on at once. So like in Call of Duty, in Team Deathmatch, there's not just one Team Deathmatch match. There are probably thousands of Team Deathmatch matches going on at the same time. And you see this little guy's all alone. And you see that this little guy's all alone here. Poor guy. Everyone else has found their match. But this guy's in his own little pool all alone. And so a pool 
is essentially a group of players who want to play in a specific way. So our pool can be the players want to play in a team deathmatch pool, but you can actually add even more filters into that. So it's not only team deathmatch, but maybe it's also dependent on skill. So maybe only the cool kids can go into the cool kids pool playing the team deathmatch, while the non-cool kids pool plays another team deathmatch. And so there's filters, which is a way for the pools to decide which tickets it will process, which you can set all of this custom information up on your end. So these filters can include your skill level, your game mode preference, languages, and even the platform that you're on. So let's say if you're on a PlayStation, you might only want to match with other PlayStation users or vice versa, Xbox, PC. Then there's even more. There's something called rules, which isn't filters. With filters, a pool will not even process the ticket unless it meets a certain filter. The rules then decide how these tickets within the pool are matched together. So the rules are more specific. For example, the rules can be if your skill level is over 100 and less than 200, then you can join that group. Or the rules can also be based on player count. So how many minimum players do you want to have in a match? Let's say you need four players to start a match. So that can be another rule. So Unity has an interface that we can use for this, which actually automatically gets turned into a JSON file with your set of rules, which are then used to group players together based on what parameters they may meet. Okay, a lot of stuff, I know. But this is super helpful to know before diving in because when I dived in, I didn't know any of these terms and I was super confused. So I've been talking about this for a while, but there is allocation. So essentially an allocation is when the server is actually started once that match is found. As you'll see, we have our clients here. They have their tickets, which is a little envelope and they've grouped up together to form a match. And the server is like, yes, finally I can be allocated, I can start up and I can bring some more fun into the world. Then we have assignment, which essentially is when the tickets are updated on the client side. So you see that now it's a check mark. So it updates the match details in each ticket once the server is allocated. So we have allocation and ticket assignment. So you see that now we have our pools being filled up with players of different skill levels and whatnot. We got the cool kids pool here. And then we got these crew that's just vibing. And there's another concept called backfill. And so we'll actually be using this and I'll show you how to use this in the project. Backfill is essentially when you already have a match ongoing. If you have backfilled enabled, you essentially allow other players to join the pre-existing or the ongoing match. So let's say in Call of Duty in Team Deathmatch, some players disconnect from the match and now the match is uneven. If you have backfilled enabled, then new players can join the match and substitute the positions. While if you have backfill disabled, then no new players can join the existing match. And so for our little snake game implementation, when one player joins, it'll start the match automatically, even if there's no other players. However, if another player joins, it will join the existing match. And so that classifies under backfill because it is joining an existing match. So as an example, everyone's left the match of this pool and he's all alone again. However, with backfield enable, now other players can join the pool. If you don't have it enabled though, this is what will happen. You'll have two different pools with two different players and none of the players will have their matches. In the case of our little snake slither IO game, one player will join. And if you don't have backfield enable, a new server will start up for each player. So that's definitely not what we want. All right, so I hope that helped you kind of understand how this works on a high level overview. And so let's now create our queue and our pool, and then we're gonna actually implement the code for this. So first let's create a queue. So our queues are essentially a group of tickets. So let's just call this queue our snake mode. So we don't have any game modes in our game. So we'll just call it snake mode and maximum players on a ticket. Here we're gonna put one because a ticket is our intent to find a match and essentially the player will be in its own party. You'll only want it to be more than one if there are going to be more players in your party. Let's say you're playing with a friend and with that you can go ahead and click create. All right, we made a queue. That was pretty easy. Now let's create a pool and for the pool, we can just call this a default pool and assign that to our snake mode. 
and the pool type, we can just select the default pool and select a timeout. In this case, I'm just going to select a 60 second timeout. So if after 50 seconds, a ticket cannot find a match, it will just time out. We can click next here. Then we select our settings. We are hosting with game server hosting. There's also relay, which can connect players without needing a dedicated game server, but that's a topic for another video. So then we select our fleet, our build configuration, and then our region, which we've all set up previously. Then we click next. And here are the rules that I was saying that you can define rules for a pool and the players will be matched to the match depending on different conditions. So let's say we give our match name arena. We want to enable backfill support as we previously mentioned. Then we need to have a team. In our case, it doesn't really matter. I can just call this snakes. So team is great for if you want to group players together to fight against each other. So like in team deathmatch, you need two teams against each other. In a free for all, in this case, everyone's their own team. So our team count minimum is going to be one. And then our team count maximum is going to be one because every player is going to be their own team. And we're going to set the player count here. Minimum player count is one. So the match cannot start without one player. And once that player spawns in, the match will start. And then the maximum amount of players, in this case, we will choose nine, as we did previously, is how many maximum players can join the match. All right, so we have the player counts, and then there's actually rules that we can add here. So we can add rules, which in Unity, we can get our player information and pass that information to matchmaker. So let's say we can pass the skill level. So here we can pass in skill level. And we have a type. So here, let's say we need a skill level greater than 100. So for the validation, we say this rule should pass this condition or vice versa. If you want it to be executed when it fails, you click the rule should fail. And then for our source, we can just select data in all players. QoS is quality of service. So quality of service is when matchmaker essentially determines the best available region for the player to get the best connection for their online session, which you can view more of it in the documentation under quality of service. You see that we can manage the results with matchmaker and it tries to find a match prioritizing the region with the lowest package loss and lowest latency. In our case, let's just select data in all players. And then for our data path, this is what we're going to be passing in from Unity. So let's call this skill. And here we have our data operations. So if we go into documentation, we see the supported operations. So you can get the medium, the average, the sum, the minimum, the maximum, or the count. In this case, I just want the number directly. We're just going to be passing the skill directly. We don't want to calculate the medium or average of the data we're passing in. And then our reference is the number that we want it to be greater than. So let's say our skill level has to be greater than 100. And you have to pass this rule in order to join this match. And so you can continue adding rules as needed. There are a ton of different operations that you can use. You can also disable rules. And so another cool thing is rule relaxations. I'm going to delete this. So for a rule relaxation, essentially what happens if our rules aren't getting passed in a certain condition, let's say a player can't find a match for a really long time because all the matches are out of his league. Well, in this case, if the player can't find a match after X amount of time, then we can relax the rule and let him join a slightly harder match just so they're not waiting for so long. So we have different types here. Let's select one just so you can see. You'll see that this rule will be enabled. That's the type when the oldest ticket in the pool has been waiting for more than X seconds. Now, in this case, we would want to put disable. So this rule will be disabled if the ticket has been waiting for more than 30 seconds, you can also replace a rule. So let's say if the player has been waiting for more than 30 seconds, instead of 100, you can set it to 50. Now it says the reference value will be replaced with 50 when the oldest ticket in the pool has been waiting for more than 30 seconds. And so I'm just going to disable this rule because we won't need it. However, you can also add these relaxations for both team count and player count. So for example, the minimum value will change to two when the youngest 
Ticket in the pool has been waiting for more than three seconds. Now this actually makes no sense. So just ignore this rule I'm making. So for the teams, we have rules, but we can also have rules for the matches themselves. And we can give this rule a name. And then similarly, we can select the type, the validation, the source, the number and the reference. And this is really cool. And so here you can click the JSON and now you can see all of our rules in an easy to view format. And you can actually edit it right here in the JSON if you're not a fan of this logic builder. All right. And so once we've made these rules, then we can create our pool. The pool is created. We don't need to create an additional pool because we don't need one. But if we go back to our queues, you'll see that we have an active queue. And if we go back to overview, you'll see that we can see some analytics on our matchmaker status, which obviously we don't have anything because we haven't connected to it yet. All right, so now that we've set up our matchmaker rules, we actually need to set it up in the Unity code. And so we need to set up some code for the server and for the client. So on the server side, we need to enable matchmaker and backfill. And on the client side, once we've verified that we're not the server and we are indeed a client, we need to authenticate the player, which we can just authenticate them anonymously for now, then create a ticket for the player pass in any information that's needed. Then we wait until the ticket is assigned. And once the ticket is assigned, then we start the client. All right, so it's gonna be quite a doozy. So get some water and ready up. So let's open our server startup script here. So after we sort our server, we're gonna wanna start our Unity services. So let's create a new function here. And it's gonna be a async function, which is asynchronous because we're gonna be querying the internet here and the data that we're gonna get back isn't going to be right away. So we have to wait for it. It's going to return a task and we're going to call this start server services. Quite a name. So for our task, I'm going to click it and click control dot. And essentially if we scroll up, it imported using system dot threading dot task. So we're going to need that for our function. All right. Then up here, when we start the server, we are also going to call await and then we're going to call start server services. And you'll see that await, there's an error because you can only call await in an async function. So just put async in front of this. And don't worry if you don't understand fully async and await. I know it took me quite a while to grab my head around it. Essentially, since these calls aren't synchronous, they're not right away. We need to wait for them. And so await will essentially stop this function from continue executing the code that comes after it until this is finished. All right, so first thing we need to do is initialize the unity services. So for that, we can do await unity services dot initialize async. And so for this, make sure you have imported using unity dot services dot core up top. All right, we scroll back down. Now let's do a try catch block here because this might throw an exception and we want to not have the whole game crash and burn. And it also helps us debug when something goes wrong. So create a try catch block here and let's import the system dot exception namespace. So if you scroll up, you can just type in using system. And so now we want to get a reference to our multiplay service. So we can do multiplay service dot instance and let's equal that to a variable that we're going to define called multiplay service. So if we scroll all the way up, you'll see that we are using unity dot services dot multiplay. And so let's create here a private variable and call this private i multiplay service underscore multiplay service. So we're going to be using this quite a bit. So let's just cache that value right here. So we get the instance. And now what we're going to want to do is start up that SQP query handler. So with that, we can do await multiplay service dot start server query handler async. And so here we're going to want to pass in a few values. We want to pass in the maximum players, the server name, the game type, the build ID and the map. And don't worry if you don't have this, we will just pass in placeholders. So for the maximum amount of players, if you watched the previous video, I actually made the connection approval handler here. It has a max players integer here. In my case, I'm going to change this from private to public and I'm going to make this static so I can access it from any script easily. So I'm going to save that. And then in the server startup, I can do connection approval handler dot max players. Then for our server name, we can just pass in n slash a not applicable. 
For our game type, we can pass in n slash a not applicable. For our build ID, we actually should pass in zero. This should not be left empty. It might throw a bug. And then for the map, we can just pass in n slash a. And so if you actually do have these values, then obviously you're going to want to pass these in. But in our case, for our little snake game, we don't need any of these extra variables. And so for the maximum amount of players, we're going to also want to convert this into a U short for it not to throw the error. And so here under the exception, let's do a debug.log warning. So a warning will be called. And then let's do a formatted string here. So in front of the quotation marks, put a dollar sign. That's a little trick here. Let's do something went wrong trying to set up the SQP service. And so let's push dash N, which is a new line. And then we put these curly braces and put in EX, which is the variable name of our exception. Essentially, this is just a formatted string. All right, so once we've initialized the Unity services connected to the SQP handler, now let's go down and we're going to connect to Matchmaker. So let's do another try catch block. I'm just going to copy this try catch here so we don't have to write this again. Just make sure you have the correct curly braces. And here I'm going to replace this with something went wrong trying to set up the allocation and backfill services and backfill services. This makes it easier for us to debug exactly what's going wrong if there's an exception. All right. So first thing we need to do is get our matchmaker payload. So get the information that we need from matchmaker. And we're going to want to make a function for this. So we're going to make a function called get matchmaker payload. And we're just going to equal this to var matchmaker payload. And then if we go here underneath this function, let's do a private asynchronous task. And this will return a match making results. And we're going to call this get matchmaker payload payload. And we're going to pass in timeout timeout into timeout. So if we scroll up, you'll see that unity services matchmaker dot models has been added for me. You'll want to add that in yourself. Make sure you have all of these. And now we want to add a const integer. Let's call this multiplay service timeout. So essentially how long we want to wait until the service times out if something's going wrong. This is around 20 seconds. This is 20,000 milliseconds. There's a thousand milliseconds in a second. Hey Siri, how many milliseconds are in a second? See, even Siri confirmed it for me. All right, now we can scroll down and here under the try catch block, we can pass in our server timeout. All right, now for the get matchmaker payload. Now this is this is a lot of boilerplate, so just, just stick with me, okay. <laughs> We're gonna make another function which is called subscribe and await, await matchmaker allocation. And let's return that and let's call it matchmaker payload task. And so this function, let's make that function. So it's also going to be a private asynchronous task, which is going to return the matchmaking results. Let's call it that same name here. And so essentially here, what we're doing is we're waiting for matchmaker to return an allocation. So a server that's started up and we want to wait until this is finished. So here we want to wait. So if await task, so this is what the task is for. So we can wait. So task dot when any matchmaker payload task task dot delay and pass in the timeout and then equals equals matchmaker payload task. So essentially this task is waiting for either this matchmaker payload task to be completed or it completes when the timeout has been reached. Now, if it has successfully returned a matchmaker payload task, you'll see that we have the comparison here, then we'll want to return, return that matchmaker payload task. We'll want to return the result else it will not execute the if statement and we'll just return null. All right. So down here, we'll actually want to get this allocation ID. So first let's check if we have our multiplay service. So if our multiplay service equals null, then we'll return null, right? Because if the service doesn't exist, then what are we going to do? And then we want to get an allocation ID. 
So let's actually scroll up and set these values just to make our lives a little easier. So we're going to have a private string underscore allocation ID. We're going to have a private multiplay event callbacks. We're going to call this server callbacks. You'll see what this is for. And then this one, we are actually going to use private I server events, but you may want to use it in your case. So I'm going to show you how to assign that. All right. So once you have these three cleared up here, we can scroll all the way back down and then let's set the allocation ID equal to null. Our server callbacks. Let's make a new multiplay event callback object. And essentially this is just subscribing to multiplay events so that we get notified when something has happened. So for example, we can do server callbacks dot, and then there's a couple things we can subscribe to. We can subscribe to deallocate to an error, to an allocate or a subscription state changed. In this case, let's subscribe to allocate. And once we allocated, let's call this function on multiplay allocation which we need to call. And then these multiplay event callbacks, we actually need to register them. So we need to do await multiplay service dot subscribe to server events async. And then we can just pass in our callbacks. And if you want, you can equal this to the server events that I previously mentioned. We're not going to use this anywhere, but perhaps that's useful to you. All right. And there's some stuff we still need to do in this function. However, let's just do this on multiplay allocation just so we can get that done and over with. Let's do a private void on multiplay allocation. And we're going to pass in a multiplay allocation allocation. So this is the allocation. Essentially, we're just going to set the ID of our allocation. So let's just check if string is null or empty. So if our allocation allocation ID string is null or empty, then let's just return. However, if we do have one, let's set our allocation ID equal to allocation dot allocation ID. And here I like to put a little debug dot log statement here, which is formatted. So let's put the dollar sign and then the quotation marks and let's do on allocation, put these curly braces and then put allocation dot allocation ID. And this is just so we can see this in the debug console. All right. And then back to our subscribe and await match allocation. So Essentially, we're subscribing to these events. Whenever we're allocated, we're going to assign the allocation ID. And so here we can also set the allocation ID and we can do await, await allocation ID. And so a lot of this code is actually included in part of a match play example that the Unity team has created on GitHub. And so you can also look through all the code there as well. Essentially, I took the code from there and made it in an easy to produce example. It is a lot of boilerplate code and a lot of stuff is abstracted. So essentially with this example, I'm trying to put it in an easy to way format to understand so you can get started on your matchmaking adventures. Anyways, back to this here. Let's create a function now. I almost call this private async task. This will return a string. And this is await allocation ID. I'm going to make this ID caps. And so this will also return the allocation ID. So this might not entirely be necessary. However, it is good just to have this here just in case. And it is useful to know that you can subscribe to these server callbacks to perform different processing depending on your needs. All right. So essentially here we want to wait until our allocation has been given to us. And so that looks like a while loop. But don't worry, we're not going to crash the program. So first we can get our config file and let's call this multiplay service dot server config. And I know I'm using var a lot. I usually never use var. However, in the unity examples, they used var. You can put the types if you'd like. However, just for simplicity, I'm going to keep it like in the samples. And then I'm just going to copy this in because it's a lot of work to type this out. But essentially, I'm just going to put a debug.log statement here, a formatted one as the other ones. Awaiting allocation server config is, I'm going to print out the server ID, allocation ID, the port, the query port, and the log directory. So that's just a more of an easy way to see what's going on. So now let's do the while loop. And so now we want to check while string is null or empty, our allocation ID. So while we don't have an allocation ID, let's wait. So let's get our 
config id config id equals config dot allocation id so here we want to check if our config has the allocation id but we haven't assigned it to our allocation id yet so we can do an if statement here so if the string dot is null or empty so if the config id which is the config allocation id so if it's not empty so if there's something but which is an and here string is null or empty our allocation id so here we're saying if we found one but we haven't assigned it yet then let's assign it so let's do an allocation id and let's just set it to the config id and then we can break and after this if statement let's just do await task dot delay and just wait for 100 milliseconds and after this while loop we can just return our allocation id all right so once that's done we can scroll back up to our await allocation id once we actually have our allocation id which means the server has been allocated a match has been found and created now we need to get the matchmaker payload information so this is just the id we don't know anything about the match yet so now we need to get information on the match so let's call this var mm payload mm meaning matchmaker payload let's do an await it's called get matchmaker allocation payload async and once we're done with that we can just return that mm payload so let's just copy that function and we'll, we'll just scroll down and do a private async task this will return a match making result here get matchmaker allocation payload async let's do a try catch block so try catch let's pass in an exception ex and i'm just going to copy in the exception from up here from our start server services function it's going to copy that down here i'm going to replace that with something went wrong trying to get the match maker payload in and put the name of the function that really helps me out when i'm needing to debug something the name of the function and so here <laughs> now we're gonna get our matchmaking results so let's do var payload allocation let's do await multiplace service multiplace service dot the instance it's a singleton that we can do get payload allocation from json as and we pass in the matchmaking results so you see that now we'll get a matchmaking results here all right and so now that we have our payload allocation just to be on the safe side we want to be able to debug.log this so put this in the console so that we can see it to do that we should convert the json to a string so we can do that with var model as json so we're going to set this variable we can do json convert dot serialize object pass in the payload allocation and then the formatting so formatting dot indented right here and so for this if you scroll all the way up we're going to need to import using newtonsoft dot json and so it's good to put these in debug dot log so that if there's something wrong in the server we can easily see that and so then we can do debug dot log and so there's another cool way instead of just copying this function here and putting it in a string we can also do name of the name of parentheses get matchmaker payload async and that will return a string with the name of the function but at the beginning let's put the dollar sign and then wrap that in quotation marks and also wrap that within the curly braces and let's put a little semicolon there let's put another dash n so we can go to the next line and put another curly braces and then let's put model as json so this is just makes it easier for us to see what's going on and then next line let's return the payload allocation all right and so after that catch block let's return null if the allocation payload has not been found so that we don't get that error anymore all right slowly getting there we scroll all the way up we have that we have this finished now where did we call this function in the get matchmaker payload which was called up here matchmaker payload in the start server services function so after we have finally gotten the payload now we can check if our payload does not equal null 
And we can do a debug.log here. Let's do the formatting with the dollar sign and put got payload, got payload. Let's do matchmaker payload. And now we can start the backfill process. So await start backfill and let's pass in the matchmaker payload. So we need the payload in order to start the backfill process, right? And just in case if the matchmaker payload is null, let's do an else statement. Let's do a debug.log warning and put some message like getting the matchmaker payload timed out starting with defaults. So if Unity isn't able to get the matchmaker information, it'll just use the default values. So let's make our start backfill function so we can just scroll all the way down, make a new function, private async task start backfill and we pass in the matchmaking results, our payload, right? So we have our payload. Now we need to start the matchmaking process. Let's also create a function here. I'm just gonna call this private pool needs players. So this just makes it easier for us to see if our match is currently full. So it'll return true if the match isn't full. If it is full, it will return false. So we can do if network manager dot singleton dot connected clients dot count dot count is less than our connection approval handler dot max players, which is nine, then it will return true. All right. So here we will begin the backfilling process. So we can do a var backfill properties properties equals new. We can do backfill ticket properties and we can pass in the payload dot match properties match properties. All right, and now we actually need to create a new backfill ticket. Let's set the ID of this ticket to the payload.matchproperties.backfill ticket ID. And we can set the properties, properties equal to the backfill properties right there. And instead of these parentheses, we want to use curly braces because it is an object. So we can pass in those values automatically. And we'll assign this to a variable that we'll call local backfill ticket, which we can scroll all the way up and create a private backfill ticket and call this local backfill ticket. Let's also just declare two more variables here so we don't have to keep going up and back. So let's create a create backfill ticket options and let's call this create backfill ticket options. Let's do a private const integer underscore ticket check milliseconds and let's put a thousand milliseconds and that's how often we're going to check the ticket or how often we're going to delay until we check again. All right. So scroll all the way back down and once we have that local backfill ticket, then let's await and let's begin backfilling payload. So pass in that payload and let's create a new function, private async task, begin backfilling. Let's pass in the matchmaking results, which is the payload, which contains our information. Now let's get that information. So let's do var match properties. And let's do payload.match properties. Then let's assign that create backfill ticket options and create a new create backfill ticket options. And instead of the parentheses, let's do the curly braces. Let's set some parameters here. So this is really important. First, we need to set up the connection string, which we are going to call external connection string. Then we need the name of our queue. So in this case, we can do payload.q name. Then we need our properties. Properties equals, and then we can do new backfill ticket properties. And we can pass in the match properties that we got from here. So the external connection string is going to be the external server IP and server port that we're connecting to. This is different from the internal server IP that's on the server, which is 0.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. The external IP is the game server machine external IP. The internal IP is the one on the server executable. So we need the external IP along with the port enabled to connect the server to the matchmaker ticket instance. So we're going to scroll all the way back up 
And under internal server IP, we can do a private string underscore external server IP IP, and we can just set the default to 0, .0, .0, 0, 0, 0, And then we can do private string and call this external connection string, external connection string, put an arrow notation here, and let's do the string formatting. This is an easy way to assign a dynamic string here. Let's put the semicolons. Let's do external server IP and then semicolon, then colon, curly braces, and then the server port. So you need the server port and then you need the IP that we're connecting to. So once we get that, we can scroll down, back down and assign that external connection string, which I spelled it incorrectly. Oopsies, Let's just change that external connection string. Okay, so now we can do local backfill ticket and create a new backfill ticket. And now with that backfill ticket, we can get the ID. So local backfill ticket dot ID equals, and we can do a wait matchmaker, matchmaker service, oopsies, dot instance, dot create backfill ticket async. And we can pass in our backfill ticket options. And now that we have our backfill ticket and the ID, essentially we just need to loop constantly and check if the match needs players. And if it does need players and there is a pending ticket, then we can assign that player to the to the match. So we can just call backfill loop here, which is going to be a private async task called backfill loop. And you'll see that there is a error here because it is an asynchronous function, yet we're not calling away. So to go around that, we can just do pragma warning disable 4014. And then at the end, we can do pragma warning restore 4014. So essentially, we're disabling that warning that it needs to be awaited within this section. So here, basically, what we want to do is we will have a while loop while we need players we will continue to check for backfill tickets and assign them so we can do a while loop here while we need players so while needs players then let's approve any backfill tickets so we can say local backfill ticket equals await matchmaker service dot instance dot approve backfill ticket async and we can pass in our local backfill ticket and the id now, if we don't need any more players, so if we don't need players, so we're full, if the match is full, we can do a wait matchmaker service dot instance dot delete backfill ticket async. We can delete that ticket because we no longer need to check and pass in that ID. We can return. Then after the if statement, we can await task dot delay and pass in the ticket check milliseconds. The backfill documents recommend a once per second approval for backfill tickets. And then I forgot here, we can also set the local backfill ticket dot ID equals to null. And so we're not done yet, but just one little nitpick of mine that I just noticed. When we allocate the server callback, we subscribe to this. So just make sure to unsubscribe to this when you are finished. So we don't have any unnecessary memory leaks. So for example, we can have a function private void dispose here and do server callbacks dot allocate minus equals on multiplay allocation. And you can also do server events question mark and then unsubscribe async. So essentially we're checking if this is not null. If it's not null, then we can subscribe from the server events. And so this dispose function, I'm going to move it all the way down. And so this depends on your case. In my case, the game is super simple, but you should call these dispose functions and make sure everything's cleaned up either after your client disconnects or after you're done using these calls in your code. So I'm just going to go leave that there and let's go back to the backfill loop. So the backfill loop, while it needs players, it's going to approve these backfill tickets. But when the match is full, this will stop getting called. However, if the match is full and later on a player leaves, then we still need to enable this backfill. And we don't want this to be running all the time because if the match is full, we don't need to approve any backfill tickets. And we don't need to have this while loop running for no reason. So what we're going to do is when we called start backfill, we pass in this matchmaking results payload. 
So we're going to still use the same payload. Right here, you'll see that we have our matchmaking payload. We're going to actually set this value so we can use it later on. So let's do a private matchmaking results and let's call this matchmaking payload. And so let's copy that variable. Let's scroll down to our start server services function where we get the matchmaker payload. Let's equal it to that and let's replace these values with the matchmaker payload variable we just made. And so essentially when we start the server, there's actually an event we can subscribe to. So network manager singleton dot on client disconnect callback. We can do client disconnected. And so we can scroll down We can do a private void client disconnected. So here we can check if the network manager dot singleton dot connected clients is greater than zero. So if there's at least one connected client and we need some players, then we can begin the backfilling process once again. And the backfilling process, you'll see that when we begin backfilling, we can just pass in the previous payload that we got. So we can pass in our matchmaking payload. And right here for connected clients, let's just put dot count. So essentially we check once a client has disconnected, do we need to enable backfill? If so, let's begin the backfilling process again. And since we already set our local backfill ticket in the start backfill function here, we don't need to do that. That's why we're just calling the begin backfilling directly because we already have the local backfill ticket filled out. And I made a small mistake here in the begin backfilling function. I accidentally created a new backfill ticket when we already made one up here. So that was my bad. Just delete that. It's a long video. I'm a little tired. <laughs> so here we're setting the ID. And then here we can check if the ID is already not set. So if string dot is null or empty, we can do the local backfill ticket dot ID. Then we set the ID. So only if it's empty, then we can set that ID. And we would pass in these ticket options so that it knows exactly what match to connect us to. And so if you really want to be more optimized, you can just put this create backfill ticket options within this if statement because we're not using it outside that if statement. Alrighty, so we have an error. The client disconnected function takes in a U long, which is the client ID. So let's just scroll back down and under the client disconnected, let's just take a U long client ID, but we won't actually be using it. And lastly, for the backfill ticket, for the external connection string and the external server IP, we also need to check for that in the command line arguments. So we can do if args at i equals equals dash ip. And let's just copy this one here so we can check that we're in the range of the array. Then we can set the external server IP equals to the arguments i plus one. Alrighty, that's the gist of this script. So there's quite a lot going on. We still need to work on the matchmaker client side. So let's just do a quick overview of what's going on here. So first we check if we are a server or not with the command line arguments that's used to run this executable. And so if it is a server, we will have these command line arguments. We'll be able to check the one that we gave UGS, which is dedicated server. And we can say server equals true. We can check the port that's assigned, which UGS automatically fills that in for us along with the IP that's assigned. Then if it's a server, we start the server. So here we're just setting the server and the port. Then we're starting the server. And then if the client disconnected, we call this callback. After that, we start the services. So we scroll down here. We have to call unity services dot initialize async or this will in fact not work. Then we can get a reference to our multiplay service instance. Later, we need to initialize the SQP server query handler so that it can get information on our server analytics, crashes, etc. You can pass in these parameters. Make sure not to leave these empty. It might throw a bug. Next, we try to get the matchmaker payload information. We pass in a timeout. So in that function, essentially here, we're just waiting for the allocation or if it times out, then 
we return, we scroll down here, subscribe and wait for matchmaker allocation. Here we're subscribing to some events so we can be notified when the allocation has finished. Essentially, the allocation is when the server has been started and assigned match is found. So a server is started up. And then here we're just subscribing to those server events. And later we call await allocation ID. And this is where we actually do a while loop to check continuously if we finally have our allocation ID from the config, which we can call multiplayservice.server config. And we wait for a bit before calling this while loop again, 100 milliseconds. And so essentially, once the allocation ID is assigned, so it can be assigned here, or we subscribe to this on multiplay allocation event, so it can also be assigned via here. Once we have that allocation ID, then we can get the actual payload from that allocation. So we can go down, get matchmaker allocation payload async. And here's where we just query the multiplay service instance and get the payload from the JSON and convert it into matchmaking result object. And here we're just converting that into a string so that we can print it out just for debug purposes. And so if we scroll back up, once we get that matchmaker payload, then we return that and we can scroll all the way back up to the start server services. And here, if we finally have the matchmaker payload, then we can start the backfill, which essentially allows other players to join the match, even if the match is already running. So it won't spin up a new server. Every time a player tries to join, they will try to join the existing match. You may or may not want this in your game. In my case, I enabled it. If you don't want this in your game, then you can just comment this out and ignore this backfill function. So if we are backfilling, then we can go all the way down. We can start the backfill process. We can get the match properties from the payload assign a new backfill ticket properties, create a new backfill ticket with the ID from the payload and with the properties, and we can begin the backfilling process. And so here in the begin backfilling, if we don't already have a local backfill ticket, then it will create one given our connection, our queue name and the properties, which by the way, you can just put the match properties within this if statement, cause that's the only place that we're using it. So if the local backfill ticket ID doesn't already exist, then it'll create it for us. And then we can start the actual loop. So here we're just waiting until the match is full. So while we need players in the match, then approve any backfill tickets that there are. If we are full, so this needs player just checks if the connected clients count is less than the maximum amount of players, which is a constant variable that I defined in another class. So we go back up to the backfill loop. We don't need any more players then we can just delete the backfill ticket async, pass in the ID, we can set the ID to null and then return. All right here, we're just awaiting a certain amount of time before running this while loop again. And you see that when a client is disconnected, we check if the amount of connected clients is greater than zero. And if we need players, then we begin the backfilling process. One little small mistake that I noticed was that we shouldn't begin backfilling if we already are backfilling. So here in the backfill loop, we can do while backfilling and it needs players. So we can scroll all the way up and set a Boolean variable, private bool backfilling equals to false. So that's just so that we can check here on client disconnected. If not backfilling, so if it's already not backfilling, put an underscore in front of it. And here in the backfill loop, we can set backfilling equal to false here. We can also set it to false out here just in case. And so here in the begin backfilling function, before we start the loop, we can just do backfilling equals to true. So this is just a Boolean that lets us know if we are already backfilling. So while we're backfilling and while we need players, etc., set the backfilling to false. If we don't need any more players, the backfilling's done. If a client disconnects, we check if we're already backfilling. If we're not backfilling, then start backfilling if we need to. All right, so now on the client side, we need to configure it, obviously. <laughs> We're not done yet. Um, if we go back to the editor and under the canvas, you see there's a bunch of buttons here, which we don't actually need anymore because this is only gonna be displayed on the client. So you can select the host and the server button by clicking on one, shift, click on the other, disable them. The client button, we can expand that and rename that to start. And I'm going to go into the client button, click the anchor preset 
press alt shift click the middle so it positions it in the middle then i'm going to press this and enable the constrained property so that it scales proportionally and just put that length at the beginning and just increase that scale another thing i'm going to do is under the player canvas under canvas i'm going to disable that and once we click that client button let's also add another event on click add in that player canvas and then select canvas enabled bool enabled and set that to true and i'm just going to move this one on top here so these are just little quality of life improvements and so now for the client script let's create a script so right click and create a c sharp script let's call it matchmaker client client so we want to run the client script once we verify that this is indeed a client so what we're going to do is on the server startup we scroll all the way up right here if it's a server we can do else if it's not a server it's going to be a client so we're going to make an event let's call it client instance and we're going to invoke that event invoke and let's actually put a little question mark which is essentially a nullable which if it's not null then let's invoke it now we can scroll all the way up and create a public static event public static event system.action and call this client instance instance it's static so we can easily just subscribe to it from any other class but you may want to reconsider using static depending on your use cases so if we are a client then we will invoke the client so on the matchmaker client side here i'm going to remove this systems.collections because we don't need it we're going to use the other one though we can do an on enable function all right so on on enable let's subscribe to the server startup dot client instance and let's make a function called sign in and then on disable let's unsubscribe from this event so server startup dot client instance minus equals sign in auto completed for me let's do a private async void sign in we're gonna make another function private async task client sign in I'm gonna pass in a string service profile name and so here we can just import using system.threading.task so we can use the task call here and so essentially here what we want to do is that we want to initialize the unity services now if you want to be able to test locally let's say on parallel sync which is what i was using in the previous video so it lets you set up multiple clones running the editor so that you can easily test different clients then we're going to have to do a little bit of processing, which is what the service profile name is. Usually you can just do await unity services and do initialize async. However, if we're running on the same local host, there might be some issues running multiple clients and connecting to that matchmaker instance. So what we can do is initialize a service profile name. So we can do if service profile name does not equal null else we can initialize it normally then we can do service profile name equals and let's do the dollar sign this is a formatted string let's do curly braces and let's enter the service profile name and then we're going to make a function get clone number suffix so we're going to actually query the parallel sync in this case api to get what id we are so that we can create a unique service profile name and then we can initialize unity services with that so we can do var init options and we can do new initialization options initialization options we can do init options dot set profile we can set the service profile name and then we can do await unity services dot initialize async and we can pass in the init options here and so if you scroll up we need to add in using unity services.core and using unity .services .authentication. And so let's scroll down and let's make that private. I'm gonna return a string, get clone number suffix. And so this is more of the parallel sync stuff here. For that, we're gonna need to import the parallel sync namespace so that we can use those functions. We can put using parallel sync and we only want to do this if we are in the unity editor we can use the directive here if unity underscore editor then we can use that we have to do end if here 
and we're gonna want to use that directive here as well so we only want this function to be executed if we are in the unity editor and additionally up here let's also include the if unity editor and end that here and if so we only want to call the parallel sync stuff when we're in the unity editor so right here let's query that so we can do clones manager dot get current project path we can do string project path so once we get that project path then essentially we're just gonna want to see what the index is so a little bit of string processing here so we're gonna do last index of and underscore so we're gonna find out where that underscore is and after that underscore we're gonna be able to find the index so we can do last underscore make that an integer then we can do string project clone suffix we can do project path dot substring we can do last underscore and then add one so last underscore is the index and then we're getting then we're getting whatever comes after that and then we can check if project clone suffix dot length does not equal one then we can do project clone suffix equals quotation marks and then we can just return the project clone suffix and let's put a curly brace before the end if seems there was an error there and so here we're basically checking if the length of this string is equal to one if it is equal to one that means there is a index after if it's not, that means that we are not a clone. We are just the editor. And we can just set the suffix equal to an empty quotation mark. All right, now back to the client sign in. After this elf statement, we can just do a debug.log. And this is more just for us and make it a little dollar sign. ka -ching. Signed in anonymously as. And then let's put the curly braces and let's put service profile name. Let's put a parentheses there and do another curly braces and then player ID, which is a function which we can define here. So we can define private string player ID. You can also make this static or in like a helper class or whatnot. And we can return the authentication service dot instance dot player ID. This is so we can debug this easily. And so each player has a player ID and we're going to print that out there. All right. And so now once we've initialized the client sign in let's go back to the sign in function here and call await client sign in and i'm just going to pass in a service profile name of snake player for now you should probably remove this though if you are in production all right and then we can do await authentication service dot instance and we can sign in anonymously async and now we want to make a function that's called when we click that start button. So let's make that public function here and let's make that function called public void start client. And let's create a function, another one. Yeah, I know there's a lot of functions. Create a ticket. Oh, create a ticket. That's going to be the name of our function. So now we have to create that ticket that I told you about, which is the intent for a player to find a match. So for this, it's going to be a private async void. We're going to do create a ticket. Ticket. Alrighty. So we have the create a ticket function here. Now we need to create ticket options. So var options equals new create ticket, create ticket options. And if you scroll all the way up, you're going to see that we are using the Unity service matchmaker. So be sure to include that within your code. So this works properly. All right, here we can enter our queue name, which we called it snake mode, snake mode. Then we can create a ticket, but first we need to pass in the list of our players. So we can do var players equals new list of player. And you'll see that this is a list. For the list, you have to make sure to import the systems.collections.generic. And if you're wondering why it's a list, for example, let's say you're in Call of Duty and you're in a party with your friend, you're going to want to put you and your friend both in this list so that you both get connected to a match. So that's why it's a list here. And so then we can create a new player, which by the way, it's missing that player. So we can just scroll up and add that in here under matchmaker. It's using unity.services.matchmaker.models. 
And let's also import something that we're going to also use later on. So we're going to do using status options, status options. We're going to equal that to unity dot services dot matchmaker dot models dot multiplay assignment dot status options or status options. So we can easily call this with uh, status options here. That's why we're equaling it here. You're going to see that in a little bit. But scrolling back down to our player, kind of lonely the player. Let's insert our player ID here, right? And then here's where we can actually pass in any matchmaking player data. Down here, we can create a public or a private class. We can do matchmaking, matchmaking player data. And this is where you'd put something like public int skill. And make sure to make this serializable, serializable. All right, and we can scroll back up here. We can pass in our new matchmaking, new match making player data, which is a curly braces here. And we can pass in the skill, any skill that you want. And of course you can fetch this from the player. You can keep track of the player stats in the database, etc. But I just want to show you how to, you can keep track of the player stats in a database. I just want to show you how to actually pass in information into matchmakers so that you can match players based on specific rules, All right? And so now that we have our players here, we can create the ticket. So we can do a var ticket response. We can await the matchmaker service. You can do instance and we can do create ticket async. We can pass in the players and the options. Then we're going to make a private variable ticket ID to ticket response ID. So we're just getting the ID from the response. We can just debug dot log that ticket ID. Let's make it a formatted string and let's do ticket ID curly braces and you can just do ticket ID and then we're going to call a function poll ticket status. So this essentially will keep running and checking if the ticket has been assigned. So scroll up and let's declare that variable, which is going to be a private string ticket ID. All right. If we scroll all the way back down, now we can make that poll ticket status function. So we can do private async void poll ticket status status. And now we can do multiplay assignment equals null bool got assignment equals false. You're going to see why in a bit. And then we're going to do a while loop. So we're just going to do a do while loop. So do this while we don't have the assignment got assignment. So essentially the do while loop will do something before checking this condition. All right. So let's await await task dot delay and we can do time span from seconds one, which just pauses the function for one second. And you can change this depending on your needs. Then we can check the ticket status ticket status equals await matchmaker service dot instance dot instance dot get ticket async. And then we can pass in our ticket ID. We can do if ticket status equals null, then let's just continue and run that do while loop again. Else, if we finally have a ticket, then we can do something. So we can do here if ticket status dot type equals type of multiplay assignment, multiplay assignment. Let's do it. curly braces. And we can do assignment. Then I forgot here to call this multiplay assignment up here. But we can then set multiply assignment equal to ticket status dot value. And we can do that as a multiply assignment. So just kind of casting the value to a multiply assignment. And once we get that multiply assignment, then we can do a switch statement here. We can do multiply assignment dot status. There's a couple of status options here, so we can do case. A switch statement will basically execute specific code depending on what value you feed it. So in this case, if it's a status options dot found. So if we found the assignment, then got assignment equals true. And we can call ticket assigned, which we will do in a minute. And let's pass in the multiplay assignment there. And you can just break out of this 
switch statement. There's also the case where the status option is in progress. So status options in progress, which in this case we just break because it's still going on. Then there's the case that it fails. So we got the assignment, but it failed. So we can do debug.log and let's do an error, log error. And here we can do the formatted string. We can do failed to get ticket status. We can do error and pass in the assignment, multiplay assignment dot message. Okay, we can break from that. And we have another case where it's a timeout. So we can do got assignment equals to true. We can do debug dot log error. You can do fail to get ticket status, ticket timed out. And we can do break. And finally, we have a default just in case none of the other cases are called. We can just throw a new invalid operation exception. So for that, make sure that your system namespace is imported at the top. And so that's all dandy. So let's actually make the function for when the ticket is assigned, right? So we got private void ticket assigned, assigned. We can do multiplay assignment call this assignment and we do debug.log so formatted string here we can do ticket assigned with assignment.ip and do a colon there and then we can do assignment.port and you'll see that now with this ip in the port we can actually do network manager.singleton we can get that unity transport component that's also attached to that game object. We can then set the connection data, set it to the assignment.ip, comma, and then the assignment.port, right? And then we want to make sure to cast the port to a U short. And so you can also check if this is null beforehand. Writer is complaining here. And then once we actually set it, now we can actually start the client. Network manager.singleton.start client. Ta-da! We did it! So let's go over this script once again. So once we make sure that we are a client instance, which on the server startup, basically we're checking if we're not the dedicated server, then what we're going to do is we're going to sign in. So we're going to initialize the Unity services. If we are on the editor, then we want to make sure to initialize the services to account for parallel sync because that can cause a bug and not work properly. So essentially we're querying the API for parallel sync to get the ID of the editor using this code. And then we're initializing it using some initialization options and setting the profile. Then we are signing in the player anonymously and this all happens at the start. And then when the player clicks on the UI button to start the match, it's going to call start client. So we have to sign that, which will create a ticket we create a ticket options object here with some parameters such as the queue name. And this is also where you can add in the attributes or filters for determining what pool to allocate. So this can be the region, the console, et cetera. And you'll see that that's a dictionary of a string and an object of attributes, the string being the attribute name, and then the object being the value. Then we have to make our players. So right now we only have one player. We don't have a party. We have to pass in the player ID, which the player ID, you can just query the authentication service dot instance dot player ID. Then you can also pass in data to the matchmaker for the rules so that the players can be matched depending on their skill levels or whatnot, whatever rules that you set. And you can see here, it accepts the custom data object. In this case, I made a new class down here called matchmaking player data, make it serializable. That's important. And then I added that skill parameter there, which you can then query in your rules and check if a skill is past a certain level or not. And then we just create a new ticket via the matchmaker instance, pass in the players, pass in the options. Then we get the ID once that's created. And then we have to pull the ticket status because the player actually has to find the match. So for that, essentially we're doing a while loop we're waiting one second each time we're getting the ticket from the matchmaker instance. Then we're checking if the ticket has the value and if the value is found, then we can assign the ticket else if it failed, well, it fails. 
Otherwise, it continues the loop. And then if the ticket is assigned, we can successfully get the IP and the port from the multiplay assignment object. Then we can set the IP and port in the Unity transport with the set connection data call. And then we can finally start the client via the network manager singleton. So that's essentially it. <laughs> I mean, that was a lot. There's also one little thing I noticed while testing it myself. There's actually a bug. Um, I was kind of hard to debug actually. So if I go into the player controller and you'll see that there's a time delta time here. So since this is server authoritative movement, the server delta time is not going to be the same as your client delta time. Instead of this time dot delta time, we're going to want to replace that with network manager dot singleton dot server time dot fixed delta time. So essentially that makes it so that your player moves at the fixed delta time of the server. And that's important. And so you're going to want to make sure if you're doing any time delta times on the server that you use this instead or else if you have any problems that something's just moving super slow or super fast. You'll see that if I'm on the client, that doesn't really matter. I can just use time dot delta time because I'm moving locally and then I'm just relaying that position to the server. All right, so if we go back into the editor under the client button, when we click that start button, instead of this start network, start client, which was what I was doing previously, let's just add our component here and call this the matchmaker client. And we can just drag that here. And instead here, we can call start client. So when we click the start button, we'll start the client successfully. And for the network manager, make sure that your debug simulator, everything's set to zero, because that may impact the speed of your server and clients. So that was a lot. That was a lot. So let's see if it works. Huh, I hope it does. Let's build the project to so make sure everything's compiled. Click save on everything. Now let's build. I'm going to create a new folder here for build to build to. I'm going to save this here. This is for the server because we actually have to update the files on UGS with our new build files. Sorry for the windows noise. And I can't actually build the modifier public is not valid. What the heck? Ah, so the matchmaker client, I accidentally put the end if inside the function. So don't do that. So now let's build again. All right, so we can go back into our dashboard for Unity. Then we can go to builds, click our existing build. Then under files, we can click update files. And let's just delete all the files and replace them with new files to make sure that everything is refreshed. You can also update the existing files that just have the changes. And so here we're just going to copy all those files there, upload them. All right, and then click next and click force. So it just ends all the sessions that are currently being used because no one's using our sessions anyway. But you can also do a progressive rollout. So people aren't just thrown from matches. But in this case, I'm just going to press forced. And so now we have to wait for it to sync. All right. And now once that's done syncing and it's ready, you'll see that under the status, it'll say ready under files, then supposedly it's going to work. So this also took me a while to figure out, but the test allocations won't work because we'll be allocating servers via matchmaker. So you can just ignore the test allocations for now. And last thing we need to do is we need to go to build configurations, click on the build configuration. We need to edit it and we need to add a new build config. So we need to add the IP dollar dollar IP dollar dollar. And so this is what enables us to connect to matchmaker with this IP that gets filled by UGS, which we actually check in our server startup script and we find that IP. So just finish that, make sure all of those values are set correctly. And now supposedly if we press play within our editor, we should be able to sign in anonymously. All right, so let's click start here and you might want to have like a loading screen just in case Then click start here and you'll see that it works. So let me just move this here. You see that now they are moving. And if I go to the other client, you'll see that it's moving on the other clients view correctly. Awesome. And so the food, why isn't the food showing? That's a great question. All right, so after quite a bit of debugging, I actually found a few issues and fixed the previous issue we were having. So I'm just gonna go over the fixes and explain why it works and why the past one didn't work. So first of all, in the food spawner, I changed 
this function from start to awake. And that's because in our server startup script, we have the server startup on the start function. However, if we also have this script on the start function, what was happening in my case was that the server was starting up before we can subscribe to the on server started event, meaning that our call would never get executed and our food would never spawn. Another issue I encountered was that for our coroutine, where we're spawning over time, instead of starting it how we did before in this spawn food start, we only want the coroutine to run as long as there's actual clients in the game. We don't need to spawn any food if there's no clients in the game. So what I did here is on enable and on disable, I subscribed to the network manager singleton on client connected callback and on client disconnect callback. I also unsubscribed from those events in the on disable function. So if we scroll down to those events, you'll see that on the on client connect, which takes a ulong client ID. First, we check if we are the server. So we can do that with network manager singleton is server. because We only want this to execute on the server. Then we check if the coroutine is already running. So spawning is just a Boolean, which in the coroutine, we're setting it to true when the coroutine begins and setting it to false when the coroutine finishes. If we're not already running the coroutine, then run it. Essentially, we don't want to run the coroutine more than once because that wouldn't make sense. And then on client disconnect, we check over the server right here. Then we check if the coroutine is currently running. And if it is, we check if the current amount of clients is zero. And so we set the spawning equals to false. And so if you go back to the coroutine in the while loop here, we can check if we are spawning and the amount of connected clients is greater than zero, then we can spawn the food. Additionally, in our food script, previously I had this return network object, which returns the object back to the pool. And then I despawn the object. However, after debugging, I found out that despawning the object automatically returns it to the pool. So we only need to call network despawn. And before we despawn, we should actually check if the object is spawned before despawning it. If not, you can potentially get some clashing errors that will say that an object that is not spawned cannot be despawned. So that means we can now delete the prefab from our food script. And in the food spawner, you can remove setting that food prefab in the spawn food function. And the other error, which was actually kind of tricky and it's not very obvious, and I wouldn't have figured it out if it wasn't for CodeMonkey's video that I remembered him talking about it previously. And it's that when you are hosting a game on UGS, Unity Gaming Services, Multiplay, you cannot call a server RPC from the server. You can do that locally. However, when you upload your build to Multiplay, you're not allowed to do that anymore. And so in my case, I was calling server RPCs from the server and the server RPCs weren't running. And there's absolutely no warnings or errors in the console. So you really have no idea what's going on unless you know about this. So this on trigger enter is only being called by the server. So previously this function add length server was a server RPC. However, since this is only called by the server, this function was not getting called. So I made this a regular function. So if we go to the player length and we scroll all the way down. See, I commented out the server RPC and I renamed it from add length server RPC to add length server. And so this function will only be called by the server and you have to make sure that it's only called by the server. You can also check here if it's the server. So if we're not the server, then we can return. And so with that on the player controller script, so if we go to the player controller script, I also had some code. When two players collide with each other in the on collision enter 2D, you'll see that I'm calling some RPCs here. So determine collision winner and win information server RPC. So if we go and scroll up to that, you'll see that what I did now was that I made this a server RPC because this is called from the client, but then I made another function where essentially I took what was in this function and I just made a separate function. And within that server RPC, I call that function. And why do we do this? Well, because I want to be able to call this function also from this determine collision winner server RPC. And so this function was also calling a server RPC. And as you know, you can't call server RPCs as a server. So I changed those two functions to that win information. And you'll see that in that win information, everything's rather the same. And we call these client RPCs to notify the clients if they won or lost the match. So once you've made those changes, make sure to just build again. Let's make a new build here. 
and then we're going to upload our new files to UGS. So go to UGS, builds, select your build. You'll see I even made a new build to test this. So I redid everything from scratch. I made a new build, a new build configuration, a new fleet. And then in Matchmaker, I set up the pool to use the new fleet. So under the files, you can just update your files, delete all existing files, drag your files in there and then upload. All right, now we click next. Forced ends all sessions for players using the build. Then we wait for it to get ready. And hopefully this time everything will work. <laughs> all right, now that it's ready, we can go back into our editor and now we can play start. All right, so let's click play here, crossing the fingers. And it might take a little while if the server's just starting up for the first time. And well, the ticket timed out because the server hasn't started, but if we just start it again, that's why if you have an actual game, I recommend just having one server always up and running to avoid these kind of issues. All right, so it's working. Let's see what happens when we have another client spawn in. Awesome. So let's have this client eat the food and it grows. Now this one eats the food. Excuse the little nom sounds. And the food is correctly spawning as well. So all is well in the world, which is lovely. And let's see what happens when we crash. Oh, they both died. <laughs> Well, I just tried it again and this time the bigger snake ate the little snake. So this collision code might not be 100% refined. However, for this case, it's pretty good. So yeah, that's the end of this video. It was quite a long one and I hope you enjoyed it. And I know there was a lot of moving pieces and it can be quite overwhelming. And this is actually really just the start. There's just so much more to go into a multiplayer game and more properties to configure with UGS. But it was super easy to get started, which is usually not common and provides a solid foundation for you to start your multiplayer journey. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please like and subscribe. It really, really helps me out a lot and maybe even leave a comment down below if it really helped you too. Thank you to Unity for sponsoring this video and to my patrons for the support. Their support makes these kind of videos possible. If you're interested, the link is in the description. I offer source code, early access to videos and exclusive content. Be sure to join our Discord as well to chat, post memes, or ask for help. Thank you so much for watching again. I really hope you enjoyed this video and see you next time.